some may wonder why we celebrate Christmas at all. But the truth is Christmas wouldn't be what it is today without the contributions of Unitarians. This morning, the choirs invite you to join them on a musical journey of carols that tells the stories of Unitarians who wove together Santa Claus, Christmas trees, gift giving, a focus on charity, peace, and goodwill for all to create the Christmas that the majority of Americans now celebrate. Before we can fully embrace Christmas as Unitarians, we first must start with a brief history of Christmas in early colonial America. Christmas didn't become a federal holiday in the United States until 1870, but its traditions had firmly been established decades earlier in colonial times. Christmas was celebrated as either an utterly solemn or wildly social event. As Calvinists, early Puritan settlers denounced Christmas for 150 years and in fact completely banned it altogether in Massachusetts for 20 years in the mid 17th century due to the drunken, carnival-like atmosphere surrounding the holiday. Wild partying with fireworks and guns firing were the norm in England, where it had evolved from centuries of mixing Christ's birth with winter celebrations and the Roman feast of Saturnalia. The Puritans understood its pagan roots, found no scriptural justification for celebrating Christmas, and insisted that everyone should simply ignore it. They even made it illegal in Boston, and anyone caught exhibiting the Christmas spirit was fined five shillings. Wow. But by the early 1800s, the Puritans were no longer a unified group. Conservative and liberal Puritans were divided on their beliefs about the nature of people and the nature of conversion. Liberals who were on the verge of becoming Unitarians believed that conversion was not based on the doctrine of original sin, but through but, but I'm sorry, but through education and the development of character based on following the teachings of Jesus. Christmas, the Unitarians believed, could be a holiday to promote their values of generosity, charity, and social good, and would be a wonderful way to teach these values to their children. Stephen Nissenbaum, from his book, The Battle for Christmas, reveals that it was the uni Universalists who were among the first to embrace Christmas as a religious holiday holding a Christmas service in Boston in 1789. The Unitarians called for public Christmas observances by 1800, hoping to temper the general rowdiness of the season. By that time, Unitarians had become trendsetters. Basically, they'd gone viral. They were well-educated, often wealthy, and had access to and control of the media. Unitarian thinkers began to write about Christmas, bringing their values and theology to the forefront of the conversation. In our service today, the Unitarian RUU singers and the Bell Avenue ringers will bring us beautiful and inspiring music that makes for a distinctly Unitarian Christmas, along with some of the stories and poetries from these famous Unitarians. Good morning and welcome to First Unitarian Church of Des Moines. My name is Sally Buckholt, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'll be sharing the readings today with Katie Allen. No matter who you are or where you come from, you are welcome here at First Unitarian, where we strive to grow ethically and spiritually, serve justly, and love radically. We especially welcome families with young children and infants that bring us the sounds of new life. You may take advantage of our We Worship space in the back of the auditorium as needed and hope that you, uh, your little ones, enjoy that space that's there for them. We hope that here you will find thoughts that challenge, music that inspires and entertains, and a welcome that invites you into community and people to accompany you on your journey. Please rise as you are able in body and spirit and join in this morning's gathering song, number 235, Deck the Halls.
For today's Children's Chapel, a song for children of all ages, one of our most influential moments in the transformation of Christmas in the early 1800s was the publication of was the night before Christmas, accredited to Episcopalian and sometime Unitarian Clement Clark Moore. It has since become one of the world's most popular read poems, originally penned as A Visit from St. Nicholas. It was published anonymously in the Troy Sentinel newspaper in New York in 1823, deliberately domesticating Christmas. It strongly influenced society's conceptions of Santa Claus, drastically transforming America's perception of St. Nicholas over the past two centuries. Before the poem was published, there was no unified tradition of a Christmas visitor bearing gifts for all. With a single poem, Moore transformed the legend of St. Nicholas, a lanky, stern bishop known for his acts of charity, into the myth of Santa Claus. Twas the night before Christmas recast St. Nicholas as a cheerful, rosy-cheeked elf who arrived in a sleigh pulled by eight tiny reindeer and established Christmas as a time for giving gifts to children. Unitarian minister Reverend Tracy Springberry writes, Moore's Santa Claus believed in the worth and dignity of every child and that all deserve some kindness and pleasure. He reminds us of our responsibility to be kind and generous to one another. Later, it was another Unitarian, Thomas Nash, who placed Santa on the North Pole as a message that he existed for all children of the world. An immigrant from Bavaria born in 1840, political cartoonist Thomas Nast, who was responsible for giving us our present day image of Santa Claus. He illustrated a published version of Twas the Night Before Christmas in 1870. Inspired by Moore's description of St. Nicholas, Nast first drew his images of Santa Claus at the age of 23 in 1863. Nicholas Nast first drew his images of Santa Claus for the Harper's Weekly. These two images cemented the nation's obsession with the jolly old elf, a drawing of Santa uh, distributing presents in the Union Army camp, and second, featuring Santa in his sleigh, then going down the chimney, creating 33 cartoons in all. Nast further developed Santa's image, with a little help from Coca-Cola, turning him into the figure that we recognize to, as today. And all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. Thank you. 
Our offering words this morning come from Reverend Kendall R. Gibbons. One of the great things about Christmas is that it is a sturdy holiday. Christmas doesn't wimp out when times are hard. It comes anyway, even if there are hardly any presents, even when there isn't much food to make a feast with, even if you're sad, even if the world around you is at war, even if you are living in fear and danger and depression, Christmas still comes. And when it comes, Christmas is subversive. Christmas, with its story of an unwed mother and a doubtful father, with its legend of a helpless baby born in a stable who was worshipped by some of the wisest, richest men in the world, with its tale of the child pursued by the deadly wrath of kings who escaped as a refugee to a foreign land far from home. Christmas, with its ancient enduring summons of peace on earth, goodwill to all people everywhere. You can't stop a day like that with a little hardship or greed or injustice. It will show up anyway shining the light of a midnight star into the darkest place of our collective lives. Do not underestimate the power of the manger and the hope it holds. The Christmas song of the angels is not as innocent as it sounds. It has turned the world upside down before, now. It can still can. 
we will now take this morning's offering. Partnering with our Faith in Action partners, Knock and Drop and Just Voices, gives us the opportunity to share our Christmas blessings with these partners and the wider social justice efforts of our church. May the gifts we share today shine a little light of our own with others this season. For those joining us on Zoom, I believe there will be a link in the chat for you to make your contribution. Thank you. Thank you, that was beautiful. And now, an uh, opportunity for us to have a time of meditation, reflection, or prayer. Before that, a few words for reflection. One year, a pastor received an empty jar for Christmas. The jar was decorated, but held nothing inside. Attached to the jar was a tag that told him that the jar contained peace, joy, and quiet of Christmas. He unscrewed the lid of the empty jar and heard silence. Quiet for contemplation among the bombarding sounds of Christmas, the rush of shopping and hurrying through holiday preparations. We are much better at the busy part of Christmas than we are taking time to quiet ourselves and contemplate what the season really means to each of us. Let us take a moment to get comfortable in our seats, take a few deep breaths and pause in the midst of this busy holiday season.
Thank you. And now Barb Martin is going to share our joys and concerns. A church is not just a building, but a community. And as a community of human hands and hearts, we come together to share our laughter, our music, our tears, and to bear witness and minister to one another as we struggle with life's sorrows and celebrate life's joys. Let us share together now the names of anyone that we know who could use some special care and attention as uh, we type the names, if you're online, or as we call them out loud here today, may the love of this community hold them all. May the light of our community shine on the broken places of the world. May the work of our hands and hearts support, aid, and comfort all those who hunger or thirst for food or water, justice, or freedom. May we never look away when we are needed. May those who are grieving be comforted. May those who are tired find rest. May the broken places be healed. And may those who are filled with joy and laughter be abundant. Now we light three candles, one for the joys and sorrows we have shared, and one for the names that we have written or spoken, and one last candle for all of the joys and all of the sorrows that are deeply held but remain unspoken here today. It may not have actually been the very first Christmas tree in America, but in 1832, Unitarian minister Reverend Charles Fallon, a German immigrant, Harvard professor, and minister of the Unitarian Church in Lexington, Massachusetts, usually gets the credit for the first American Christmas tree. Well, that's because an English Unitarian and author, Harriet Martineau, wrote about the charming side of the little tree decorated with candles. But other Unitarians began much earlier to share the idea of bringing a fir tree indoors. A Unitarian magazine, the Athenium, published in 1820 a German story about a Christmas tree. And in 1824, the newly created official journal of the American Unitarian Church, the Christian Register included a story about a Christmas tree. It was written by English Unitarian poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge about the, his experience on Christmas Eve of 1798. He was in Germany and saw a small evergreen tree in one of the homes that he visited. But it wasn't so much the tree that caught his eye. It was for their gift giving, the children giving small gifts to their parents. 
Coleridge writes that as they gathered around the Christmas tree with their gift giving, the eldest daughter and the mother wept aloud for joy and tenderness, and the tears ran down the face of the father as he hugged his children close. It's this image, the loving family of Christmas, a symbolic centerpiece to a day when the message is one of peace and goodwill to all. It's a message that reached the White House during the presidency of Unitarian William Howard Taft. In 1912, his son and daughter began the tradition of having the first Christmas tree on public display in the Blue Room of the White House. For most of us, the tree continues to be a reminder of light, hope, and the importance of giving to others. Little Tree by E.E. E. Cummings. Little tree, little silent Christmas tree, you are so little, you're more like a flower. Who found you in the green forest? And were you very sorry to come away? See, I will comfort you because you smell so sweetly. I will kiss your cool bark and hug you safe and tight, just as your mother would. Only don't be afraid. Look, the spangles that sleep all the year in a dark box, dreaming of being taken out and allowed to shine. The balls, the chains, red and gold, the fluffy threads. Put up your little arms, and I'll give them all to you to hold. Every finger shall have its ring, and there won't be a single place dark or unhappy. Then, when you're quite dressed, you'll stand in the window for everyone to see. And how they'll stare. Oh, but you'll be very proud. And my little sister and I will take hands and looking up at our beautiful tree, we'll dance and sing, Noel, Noel. Noel Reggie, born Leon Schlesinger, Noel Reggie, spelled backwards, was born in Strasbourg, France, and grew up Catholic, later becoming a Unitarian. He was conscripted into the Nazi army and later deserted, joining the French resistance and working as a double agent for the French. He eventually went on tour to the United States accompanying a French singer, where he met and fell in love with his wife, pianist-composer Gloria Shane. 
Together, they were commissioned to write a song. It was 1962, and the United States was facing off against the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis. With the prospect of unspeakable war, Regini found inspiration from the babies he saw while walking the streets of New York. A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Due to its allusions to the birth of Christ, Do You Hear What I Hear quickly became a popular Christmas song, although it was never intended to be religious. Having experienced the horrors of war, Reggie and Shane were making a political statement, a plea for peace, and a reminder of the ravages of war. A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite. A reference to the threat of the impending missile heading to the United States. Let us bring him silver and gold, a reference to poor children and a reminder of the human cost of war. But the final verse is the most important message. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Its message is timeless, and in human hearts, its words and melody forever stir hope for the future.
1849, Unitarian minister Reverend Edmund Hamilton Sears wrote the Angel Song, now famously known as It Came Upon a Midnight Clear. Recovering from a devastating illness, Sears had just returned to Wayland, Massachusetts as a part-time preacher while the country was still reeling from the aftermath of the Mexican-American War and the burning issue of slavery that would ultimately lead to the Civil War. In his melancholy, Sears wrote this beautiful carol calling for hope and peace at a time when the world was busy warring with themselves and not listening to the angels or God's message of peace. The tune was written a year later by a New York organist, Richard Storrs Willis, making it one of the earliest social gospel hymns written in the United States. Some criticized the carol because it didn't mention Jesus. In other circles, notably the Western Unitarian churches, there was some who thought Sears had rather old-fashioned religious ideas. <laughs> to us, it speaks of feelings familiar to all human beings, regardless of belief, the burden of struggle and sadness, and the longing for hope and peace. And man at war with man hears not the love song which they bring. Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. This contemporary message rings as true now as it did when it was first written, with the visions of a future where peace reigns over all of earth.
and poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was a household name. And his poems, like The Midnight Ride of Paul Revere and The Song of Hiawatha, were memorized and quoted all over America. But in 1863, it had been many years since he'd written an original verse. Longfellow was weary after years of hardship. His beloved wife, Fanny, had tragically died in an accidental fire, causing him to fall into a deep depression. That Christmas, he wrote in his journal, How inexpressibly sad are all holidays. A few years later, despite his deep conviction against violence, his eldest son, Charlie, left a note in his house after stealing away to join the Union Army. I have tried hard to resist the temptation of going without your leave, but I cannot any longer. Less than a year later, on December 1st, 1863, Longfellow received a telegram that every parent during wartime dreaded. Charlie had been injured in a skirmish with Confederate soldiers and was currently in a Virginia hospital. Knowing the poor conditions of battlefront medical stations, Longfellow immediately left his Boston home to search for his son. After arriving, he spent three days searching the incoming wounded, arriving at the train station, passing up and down the line of bleeding, bandaged men, limp on pallets, packed into boxcars, until he finally saw a familiar face. Charlie the prodigal son, alive but barely breathing. After being rushed to medical care and stabilized, Charlie was eventually allowed to return home to Boston. On Christmas Day, with his son still shivering with fever, possibly never to recover, Longfellow struggled with the terrible reality of the war that had torn his country apart and began to write a poem. At the time Christmas Bells was written, the outcome of the American Civil War was not yet known. Whether or not there would be peace and goodwill in the United States was a question without answer and would have weighed heavily on Longfellow. When his poem was put to music in 1872, after the war had ended, the stanzas directly related to the Civil War were omitted from the carol. They read, then from each black accursed mouth, the cannon thundered in the south. And with the sound of carols drowned of peace on earth, good will to men. It was as if an earthquake rent the hearthstones of a continent and made forlorn the households born of peace on earth, good will to men. With each line, he built a picture of darkness, and in the midst of it, hope. It ends with, then pealed the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to men. For Longfellow, peace was what was most important. And his poem strangely reflects that feeling, but he doesn't know that it will, in time, come. So he ended his work inconclusively, but hopefully, because it was the outcome he most desired, the conclusion he wanted to see both in his poetry and in the real world. Charlie did eventually recover, and he and his father were reconciled. But this wartime Christmas poem turned song still rings out a story of the triumph over hope, over despair, even today.
I extinguish the symbolic flame of this gathering. May we carry its light into the world. Please rise and stand if you are able and join us in singing song 280, 248, excuse me, We Believe in Christmas, verses 1, 2, and 4.
every time a hand reaches out to help another, that is Christmas. Every time someone puts anger aside and strives for understanding, that is Christmas. Every time people forget their differences and realize their love for each other, that is Christmas. May this Christmas bring us closer to the spirit of human understanding, closer to the blessing of peace. And now please join me in seeing the first verse only of number 245, Joy to the World. Mm -hmm. 